From time to time, in periods of trouble and despair, in times of enormous evil, the national scene or the world scene produces a person of transcendent leadership. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. was such a person. And the man whom it is my honor to introduce tonight is another such person. This month, more than ever, we all are struck by the similarities of the two lives, and we are grateful for the similarities. Bishop Desmond Tutu is a visionary, but he is more than that. He is an activist visionary, a rare kind of individual who combines qualities not often found in the same person. Just one year ago, when I was on sabbatical leave at Harvard, I heard Bishop Tutu speak. It was an electrifying occasion, a special weekday church service in Harvard's Memorial Church celebrating Desmond Tutu's life. On that occasion, I was struck by his eloquence, his compassion, his profound sense of justice and equity, and his wit. He aroused our passion and channeled our rage, but he also made us chuckle. What kind of man, I wondered, could describe so graphically, so knowingly, the evils and excesses of apartheid and still maintain a sense of humor? Watching him on television's Nightline several times over the past year as he debated white South African government officials, I wondered how a person who leads a crusade against such appalling indecency can remain so decent, can remain so sensitive, so gentle. Above all, how does he remain, while passionate, dispassionate enough to see any positive possibilities in South Africa's future? Perhaps Bishop Tutu's sensitivity and tolerance stems partly from the fact that his parents came from two different black South African ethnic groups. Undoubtedly, his patience and his ability to lead in a stormy situation were nurtured during his several years as a high school teacher. <laughs> Coming to the ministry, after the previous teaching career surely required an especially strong sense of purpose and commitment of which the whole world, including the South African government, is now aware. As a beginning priest, the Reverend Tutu's assignments to English parishes sharpened his understanding of white society. And his travels in Asia and black Africa, while associate director of the Theological Foundation Fund, broadened the perspective with which he is able to view South Africa. But in attempting to understand this remarkable man, perhaps most of all, we must understand that he is truly and profoundly a man of God. And God and years of living as an oppressed person in a land needlessly divided have given him a final crucial quality, courage. Desmond Tutu was the first black to head the interdenominational South African Council of Churches. He is Anglican Bishop of Johannesburg and holder of the 1984 Nobel Prize for Peace. It is my great honor to introduce a man of courage, Bishop Desmond Tutu.
Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Way too. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and friends, good evening. Are there people in the room? <laughs> good evening. It is a very, very great joy, a very great privilege to be part of your commemoration of one of the greatest sons of this land. Apropos of absolutely, absolutely nothing, um, there are some stories they tell in, in, in South Africa. There's one about uh, the visit that uh, President Reagan paid to South Africa to see how constructive engagement was going. And uh, he flew over in a, in a helicopter and um, flying over South Africa, over one of its uh, rivers, uh, he saw a sight to warm the cockles of his hut. I don't know what cockles are, but they were warmed. Uh, <laughs> because down below he saw P.W. Porter, the South African state president, and his uh, foreign minister, Buck Porter, in a boat, seeming to be pulling me, uh, and I was on what appeared to be water skis. <laughs> so he said he wanted to see this at close quarters, and uh, he landed on the boat and greeted the two government men very warmly and said, gentlemen, now this justifies constructive engagement. You two with Bishop Tutu. And then he, he took off. And then P.W. turns to Burke and says, um, he's a very nice man, the, the, the president, but he doesn't know anything about crocodile hunting. <laughs> <laughs> my, my first and very happy task, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is to express a very, very warm appreciation and pay a warm tribute to the people of this country and especially to university students for your commitment to our struggle for justice and peace and reconciliation in South Africa. We came to this country in 1984, my wife and I purportedly on a sabbatical. And if you had said to anyone in 1984 that in 1985, the Congress, U.S. Congress, would be discussing what sanctions, not whether sanctions, what sanctions to apply to South Africa, then most people would have said that you really had a screw loose and you needed to go and see your psychiatrist. But in 1985, the U.S. Congress did, in fact, consider applying fairly severe sanctions against South Africa. And the hand of the president of this country was forced through a, an executive order. He sought to bypass a veto override and so applied sanctions, mild sanctions, but sanctions all the same, totally against his wish. And it was because an extraordinary metamorphosis had taken place in the moral climate in this country. The people of this land had decided, in a sense, that enough was enough. And students played 
a very considerable and significant role in helping to bring about that change in the moral climate of this country. I recall visiting some of your campuses in May of last year. Now at that time, most good students are concerned about good degrees and good grades. And I am the last person to want to poo-poo good degrees and good grades. And least of all, would I want to do that um, in this place. <laughs> but it was a remarkable thing. And I said to those students I was addressing that they were giving us a renewed faith in humanity. For they were saying that there are some things that are more important than good degrees and good grades. They were saying that there are some things that are more worthwhile than how you are going to manage in the red race in the years to come. And on behalf of several, several people back home, there's somebody who visited South Africa and came back uh, pontificating about the fact that uh, I was not representative of too many people. <laughs> well, I hope he hears what I'm saying tonight. When I say that I know without fear of contradiction that at least in this one particular instance, I know that I speak on behalf of millions when I express on their behalf thanks for your commitment for your support, for your solidarity. And in many ways, it is, it is an extraordinary phenomenon to have taken place. A few years ago, somebody did a survey of university campuses in this country, and the results were that most students had grown apathetic and were far more concerned about number one. And they said there was no longer the idealism, the passion that people had shown with regard to the Vietnam issue. And then people have been galvanized into action about their concern over South Africa. And you see, it is remarkable because with Vietnam, you could say that there was a measure of self-interest in those students who were concerned about getting their boys to return. For one thing, it was Americans who were dying. And another reason for being concerned about the Vietnam War was that you, you were likely to be drafted to go and fight. With the South African issue, in many, many ways, you needn't be involved. And yet you are involved. And that's a tremendous thing. I would have liked to give you a one-man standing ovation. <laughs> Since that cannot, I mean, it can't happen, I wanted to ask, and on the whole, I, sus I suspect that uh, there are not too many things you, uh, you are likely to refuse me. <laughs> I would ask that we clap these wonderful people in this country, including yourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I am going to be very repetitive. Um, as you know, one has been speaking on a number of occasions. 
um, because basically I am saying the same thing, which reminds me of the story of the professor. <laughs> <coughs> I've got to be careful where I tell these stories. <laughs> but you see, he, he, he really had a brilliant lecture that he was giving. But it was the same lecture. I, I, I hope, I mean, he didn't give it in the same venue to the same audience, but it was a very beautiful address. He turned to his driver and said to him, you know, I'm getting bored with myself. Admittedly, it is, it, is a, it is a splendid address, but I am getting browned off repeating it uh, so many times over. And the driver said, well, actually, I've listened to it so often, I know it word perfect. And the, and the professor said, you, you don't mean it. And he said, yes, I do. <laughs> and uh, the driver rehearsed the speech, and it was word perfect. So they arranged that they were going to um, swap places. <laughs> and the driver would become the professor, and the professor would become the driver. And they arranged it so that uh, he would speak for only so long, and no time left over for questions. <laughs> Come this great day, and the driver turned professor, really delivered a scintillating, quite erudite address. <laughs> Unfortunately, he did leave, leave a little time. And as you are aware, there are almost always obstreperous people in the audience <laughs> who, who want to trip up uh, speakers. And so one of these chaps gets up and he asks a very, very involved question. And uh, our new professor says, what? Is that all? Even my driver at the back, they can answer this question. <laughs> 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 I don't have a driver. <laughs> Uh, you know, as uh, the kind of students you are, that there are probably only three ways in which you can change a socio-political dispensation which you do not like. The normal, the conventional way that uh, is open to people in a democracy is you vote people out of power whom you don't want, who have not pleased you. Now in South Africa, that route is not available to black persons. According to the new constitution of 1984, 73% of the population of South Africa, the blacks, are totally excluded from any meaningful participation in political decision making. In that constitution, you may not believe it, we, the vast majority of that land, are mentioned only once, in one sentence, and that is the end of any further reference to us. Here I stand before you, a Nobel laureate, bishop of one of the largest dioceses of our church in Southern Africa, rising 54 years of age. And some people might uh, risk suggesting that I was po perhaps reasonably responsible. In the land of my birth, I do not vote because I cannot vote. I am excluded from that facility, from the franchise, by the law of the land. An 18 year old, because he or she is white, and latterly because they are so-called colored or Indian, can vote. The South African government, in pursuance of its 
racist ideologies is depriving blacks of their South African citizenship. We are systematically being denationalized and turned into aliens in the land of our birth. Now, that is a smart ploy because you see an alien can claim very, very few rights, least of all political rights. We have foisted on us the citizenship of spuriously independent Bantustan homelands whose independence is recognized only by South Africa and her satellites. Until recently, the South African government let me travel not on a passport. I was traveling on a document called a document for travel purposes. Now you look at me. You would say that it was fairly obvious coming from South Africa that I am a South African, having been born there. I am a South African as a Kruger Rand. Now, in that document, in the space where you describe your nationality, my nationality was described as, quote, undeterminable at present. <laughs> now, I think that the initial response ought to be to laugh at this, for it is so utterly ridiculous. But it is a far more sinister thing, and the reaction ought to be a somber one. Because it represents the South African government's final solution. And I use that expression advisedly. And those of you, I hope all of you, are aware of the quite horrendous connotations of the final solution. Now let me just give you examples. In order to achieve its purposes in the balkanization of South Africa into these Bantustan homelands, which don't stand a snowball's chance in hell of ever being viable in any kind of sense, the South African government has destroyed stable black communities. It has uprooted people. It has demolished their homes, their schools, their clinics, their churches, their shops. People who have lived in an area as long as you can remember, as long as they could remember, because that area was now assigned for white occupancy, they had to move. And then, being uprooted, they were dumped. Now you hear I say dumped. You don't dump people. You dump rubbish. You dump things. The South African government has uprooted people and dumped them in those poverty-stricken Pantustan homeland resettlement camps where there is very little food, little work. In South Africa, children starve, not because there is no food. Children starve not accidentally. They starve by deliberate government policy. I visited one of these resettlement camps, and this is a story that I have vowed I will tell until apartheid has been destroyed. A little girl came out of a shack, which she shared with her widowed mother and a sister, and I asked her, Do you, does your mother get a grant or a pension? And she said, no. What do you do for food then? We borrow food. And you looked around the camp and you wondered who had food to lend to anybody else. Have you ever returned any of the food that you borrowed? Mm -mm. What do you do? 
when you can't borrow food. We drink water, she said, to fill our stomachs. We drink water to fill our stomachs in a land that is normally a net exporter of food. And this is the country that some people tell you is the last bulwark against Soviet expansionism. This is the last bulwark against communism, we are told. The father is compelled to leave his wife and children there in the resettlement camp, eking out a miserable existence, whilst he, if he's lucky, goes to the white man's town as a migrant worker to, to live in a single-sex hostel, leading an unnatural life for 11 months of the year. Why does anyone think that blacks somehow get married so that they will be separated from their wives? This is the only country in the world that I know where it is a crime for a woman to sleep with her husband if he is a migrant worker and she were to visit him in town. This is the only country in the world where it is a crime for a national to look for work if his pass is not in order. And every black person from the age of 16 upwards, male, female, must carry this document. In Nazi Germany, they wore armbands with the Star of David, and they had to have documents. We don't need Stars of David or armbands because God, as it were, has given us a recognizable armband, this, this, the color of our skin. But even as Bishop of Johannesburg, I do not have the right to move freely in the land of my birth. And this is the country that they say is the last bastion of white Western Christian civilization. Three and a half million people have been uprooted and dumped in the fashion that I have described just now. Hitler moved, I think, seven million. We are halfway there in South Africa. That is one way of changing a political system. You vote, you exercise your franchise. I've said we can't because we don't have the franchise. The other way is to overthrow the particular government violently by force. Now, almost always when people talk about South Africa, and, and they say, as they often do in press conferences, Bishop Tutu, do you, are you in favor of violence or not? The assumption in that question is that South Africa is somewhat virgin. Violence is something that is going to be introduced into South Africa from outside de novo by those who are called terrorists. But I need to underline here and say categorically, the primary, the fundamental violence and terrorism in South Africa are the terrorism and the violence of apartheid. The, the African National Congress 
our premier political organization, was founded in 1912. From that time on until it was banned by the South African government, it sought to change the political system in our country through use of the conventional nonviolent methods of demonstrations, of petitions, of deputations, even of a passive resistance campaign. And there's a tribute to the commitment of this organization to nonviolence. One of its presidents general, Albert Lutuli, was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Only two South Africans have won the Nobel Peace Prize, and both of them are black. If we needed any further evidence of our people's commitment to peaceful change, then this would have been irrefutable evidence. Our people protested peacefully against the past laws. And you remember what happened on the 21st of March, 1960? As they were protesting peacefully at Sharpville, 69 of our people were massacred by the South African police. And most of those 69 were shot in the back, running away. Our children, incensed at being given a travesty of an education, an inferior education, Bantu education, sought to protest against this. They were singing in the streets to protest peacefully against apartheid. And you know what happened in 1976 in June, over 500 people were killed. Some had to go into exile. Some were detained. In 1960, after Sharpville, the, the South African government banned the ANC and the PAC. And these organizations said, we have tried everything. We have no other option but to espouse the armed struggle. Now, I am at a loss to understand when the Germans, the French, the Dutch, and others resisted Nazism in the underground movement, they were loaded to the skies. And a Dietrich Bonhoeffer is regarded as a modern day martyr and saint. And I think rightly. But you know that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed because he was involved in a plot to assassinate Hitler. And then when it comes to the question of black liberation in South Africa, the West wakes up and finds it has turned pacifist. <laughs> you have seen the violence of apartheid. You saw it almost every day on your screens. And it was so horrendous that the South African government decided that it was going to put a ban on the reporting of unrest. You are accustomed to things called due process. When somebody is arrested, they have to appear in an open court as soon as possible to be arraigned before that court. And the evidence that the police produce has to be tested rigorously. And the accused is presumed to be innocent 
until they have been proven beyond all reasonable doubt that they are guilty. They have access to a lawyer and have the right to the best defense possible. In South Africa, many, many people are detained without trial and held in communicado. And often, strange things happen to them. I want to warn you, when you go to South Africa and you get into trouble with the police, don't sit on their chairs because we've got some very strange chairs. Some people dying mysteriously in detention. You ask, what happened? And you're told they fell off a chair. <laughs> very strange chairs. You know what they did to a Steve Beagle. They bashed his brains out. And when he was comatose, they conveyed him naked on the back of a jeep for 800 miles from the coast to Pretoria, where he died. And the inquest said no one was to blame for his death. Recently, a four-year-old was killed with a rubber bullet. Now, the only people who shoot rubber bullets are the police. And that four-year-old could not have been said to have th <laughs> thrown stones or anything of this kind. The inquest says no one is to blame. Now, if there is to be a condemnation of terrorism and violence, I would hope people would know where to start. So we're saying we don't want the second option of trying to change that system violently. So we are left with the peaceful option. Peaceful protest in South Africa is virtually impossible. Alan Busa tried to lead a peaceful demonstration to Paul's Moore prison where Nelson Mandela and others are incarcerated and he was detained before he could do so. Elderly people in a township, Mami Lodi, just outside Pretoria, tried to protest peacefully. Not young stone throwers. And there were no television crews because this came after the government had placed its ban on television crews reporting. Those, they said, were often a catalyst for, for unrest. Peaceful demonstration. The police killed 13. Since, October, since August of 1984, a 1,000 people have died at home. It is as if you are swatting flies. I am opposed to all forms of violence. I say this ad nauseum. I say I'm opposed to all forms of violence, the violence of a repressive system and the violence that seeks to overthrow it. But my dear friends, when landmines explode, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten whites get killed, let me say, one death is one too many for me, and I am deeply distressed. But a thousand of our people die. There is very little outrage. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten white people get killed, and we hear shouts of terrorism. 
Now, I hope, I mean, that the world will try to be even-handed. Now, we suggest that it is possible, it is still possible for the South African situation to be resolved reasonably peacefully. We are on the brink of a catastrophe, but it is possible to be pulled back from that brink if the international community is ready to exert the right kind of pressure on the South African government to urge it to go to the negotiating table with the authentic representatives of every section of our community. This is what we long for. And we say to the international community, for goodness sake, will you please apply political, diplomatic, but above all, economic pressure on the South African government. And let us, let us make it quite clear. We are not asking that you make a political decision. We're not asking you to make an economic decision. We're asking you to make a moral decision. Because whether they like it or not, whether they intend it or not, those who invest in South Africa, for goodness sake, must know that they do so, and in doing so are upholding and buttressing one of the most vicious systems the world has ever known. And dear friends, let's not kid ourselves. In a situation of injustice and oppression, there can be no neutrality. You have to take sides. You have to say, am I on the side of justice or am I on the side of injustice? When, when an elephant is sitting on the tail of a mouse and you say, I am neutral, the mouse is not going to be particularly pleased about your neutrality. You have already made a decision. You have decided to, to be on the side of the powerful, of the elephant. There is no neutrality. You have already, in fact, made a choice. Now, this great country, what is it? The land of the, the land of the free and the home of the brave. <laughs> does have an extraordinary penchant for backing the wrong horse. It is enough to say you are anti-communist, and then this country doesn't care two buttons what you do with human rights in your country. <laughs> and then we hear some extraordinary things. You talk about sanctions against South Africa, and then they say, oh, you know, Blacks will be the first to suffer, will be the ones to be hit most hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to say that I haven't heard similar sentiments expressed when sanctions were applied to Poland. I haven't heard the same uh, sentiments expressed that we, well, sanctions are not effective, we will hurt those whom we wish to help most of all. When you apply sanctions to Nicaragua, yeah. I, 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 I haven't heard the same argument used when sanctions have been applied to Libya. And 
we, we, we have one or two uh, sort of responses when people say blacks will suffer. We say, but blacks are suffering now. Uh, and if it means the system is going to be changed by blacks taking on additional suffering, they will do so. They said they will do so. A recent, two recent surveys have indicated that overwhelmingly, over 70% of blacks say sanctions of some sort or other have to be applied to South Africa. So blacks have spoken. But the other response is, now when did you suddenly become so altruistic? You have been benefiting from black misery and suffering. Who have supplied the cheap labor? Blacks. How have they supplied it? They've supplied it in the ways that I have indicated, being migrant workers. And we haven't heard a squeak out of all of those who suddenly discover that they are so philanthropic and they've suddenly got our interests at heart when they have been benefiting from our misery and the only time they've suddenly become so sensitive is because the disinvestment campaign has brought pressure on them to justify their existence in South Africa. talk about reforming apartheid. We are not interested in reforming apartheid. <laughs> we, you don't reform a Frankenstein, you destroy a Frankenstein. <laughs> no matter what you in this country or anywhere else do or don't do, we're going to be free. We, but we, we want a new South Africa for all of its people, black and white. We want a South Africa where people count, not because of biological irrelevances, the color of their skin or any other thing, where people count because of who they are, persons of infinite worth because they are created in the image of God. We want a new South Africa that is democratic, truly democratic. We want a South Africa that is truly just. And it's going to happen. But we'd like to be able to say, America made the right moral choice. America helped us to become free. Thank you.
Bishop Tutu. Bishop Tutu, I am sure that you don't. Bishop Tutu has had oh. Bishop Tutu has had a very long day. This is his third talk today, and he has four speeches tomorrow. Given that schedule, we are enormously grateful to you for coming to Stanford. We are particularly honored that you would come at the time that we are celebrating the first national holiday in honor of a black American. We have been moved by your eloquence and touched by your message. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to thank each and every one of you on behalf of the Martin Luther King Commemorative Program Committee for joining us here for what proved to be a very invigorating and enlightening program. Um, the honor of having Bishop Tutu here and the wealth of all that each and every one of you brought to this auditorium this afternoon is something that will long be remembered. I'd like for you to keep in mind the remaining programs on the calendar for the Martin Luther King commemorative events, and look forward to the upcoming events sponsored by Black Liberation Month. Finally, in closing, because as Professor Gibbs indicated, this has been a very long day for Bishop Tutu, and we need to get on with the business ahead of us. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Bishop Tutu's son-in-law, Mon Tun Z, who is backstage at this time and give him a hand for traveling along with them. He's <laughs> We've had some very interesting conversations backstage, so I think he's really picked up a lot in uh, his brief visit to the States. I'd like to give thanks to the Adelphi Foundation who um, are helping to sponsor this particular event, uh, which is chaired by the co-chairs, Bishop Swing and Mrs. Melvin Belli. So thank all of you. We look forward to seeing you at future programs. And again, 
take something away from you this evening. We tried to put it out there for you.